Hello everybody and welcome to Backyard Farmer. I'm Kim Todd. I'll be your host tonight as we answer your gardening questions. You might notice my interesting hairdo. That would be because I have cancer. My hair is falling out in wads and uh, it will disappear and I will wear some sort of a hat. We're gonna do a caring bridge, so that will be a way for you to get your questions answered and me to update you. We're also gonna do things as normally as possible. I'm gonna wear red with purple, kick people and cancer with my boots. We're gonna start with normalcy and a sample with Jonathan. Okie dokie. <laughs> Uh, so today I brought with me some green bottle flies. These are some flies that people often find in their houses at this time of year. And they are a fly that feeds on decomposing material. So they often end up on meat scraps or they end up on decomposing animals very often and fecal material. If you're a sheep farmer, you may have seen these and their maggots and wads on your sheep's rear end where the, the feces accumulates. So they're very green and metallic. They're a little bit bigger than a normal house fly and people often see them banging their heads into windows. They're not very intelligent insects. And uh, they get really annoying because they can come out in this plume and it's an indicator that you need to maybe look around and clean some stuff up in the garbage can, wash it out, take your garbage out more frequently, have a garbage can with a tight fitting lid, or you may need to do a check for decaying animals somewhere. If you get rid of that larval habitat, you will see fewer flies and you can put some fly strips up to try and catch the adults that are buzzing around in your house. But no bug bombs or anything like that, please. Right, and don't run into the yellow fly strips in the dark. By That's right, yeah, get, get them stuck on your face. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Dennis. <laughs> okay, it's July. It's that time of the year when those bats, the young of the year, are flying. And what we say about bats, let them fly till July. Well, it's July, so it's the time to first get them out and then cock it up. And so if you have a slit or a crack and a shutter where the bats are coming in and out, you can just hang one inch by half inch netting. You can put weight at the bottom. The bats will come out at night, drop down, fly, and then they won't be able to come back in through the crack. Then after about a week, most of them have to come out to drink or feed and the babies are all coming out as well. Then you can caulk and seal these cracks. And because bats have a hard time chewing through most types of caulking, almost any type of caulking will work. And if you really want to make it strong, just mix some coarse steel wool in with your caulking and you got them sealed out and they'll have to find another place to live. Perfect. And a bat house isn't a really good choice, right? You can use a bat house. Okay. It's just hard to get them to go to the bat house. Okay. All right. Excellent. Good idea and pretty simple. Mm -hmm. Okay, Amy, you know, it's been tomato year and Clearly you have something else that is. I know. And I know everybody's waiting for that first red tomato, the big ones, the cherry ones you've been able to pick down here. My neck of the woods, there's no ripe tomatoes yet. But this is a sample Kyle was nice enough to share with me. And the camera guys are so great. If you take a look, you're gonna actually see some concentric rings, so different colors on the fruits of dark green and light green. And the fruit's a little misshapen too. Um, by the looks of it, I would probably call this tomato spotted wilt virus. Um, it is transmitted by insects. It goes to a lot of different ornamental plants. There isn't a lot we can do. Now, can we eat the fruit once it matures? Yes, you can. It's gonna have that beautiful mosaic colors to a pathologist, they're beautiful, of reds and yellows and oranges, and there won't be a solid red coloration, but you can eat it and the virus isn't gonna hurt you at all. Um, with how severe this plant is infected, I would probably say our total fruit production is gonna be very limited on this plant. So if you don't really like it, you can rogue it out like Lauren would say and hope that your other tomatoes are able to make up for it. Is it one of those ones that you also need to rotate? Yeah. Not necessarily, just because it infects so many other plant species. So in patients and um, flocks, and there's just so many different ornamentals that this virus is able to infect. It has over 90 hosts. Holy cow. So it, it's in your landscape, there isn't a lot we can do about it. All right, thank you, Amy. All right, I know your flower <laughs> fell apart, but. <laughs> I know, my flower is wilting, so I'm trying to hold it open so you can kind of get the effect of it. But there's not a lot of summer blooming shrubs out there, but this is our hardy hibiscus, uh, better known as Rose of Sharon or Shrub Althea. And I'm going to let go of it. This is one from my own yard. It didn't make the trip from Columbus very well. But this is a very hardy shrub, uh, awesome bloomer from July uh, through August for sure, even into September, loaded with flowers. Um, you can see there's always already some buds back here that are ready 
Um, to open up, this one is probably spent, and, uh, but these will follow and it'll continue to bloom. Um, it, it takes heat and humidity very well. It blooms best in full sun, but will tolerate part shade. They are, quite, they are fairly large, anywhere from six to 10 feet tall and uh, three to four feet wide, well, four to six feet wide. Um, they prefer good soil, but they will tolerate poor urban soils as well. So just a good shrub uh, for a summer bloomer. Awesome, thank you, Kelly. All right, first picks are yours, and this is sort of a series of pictures Ooh. because we had so many insect questions <laughs> this week, Jonathan. It's bug time. Uh, it's, it's bug time. Yeah. yeah, this is beetle mania, actually. Beetle mania. <laughs> <laughs> so we have, what is this? It landed on the deck at night at Woodcliffe Lake okay. near Fremont. Okay, uh, this is some kind of lined June beetle. It is lacking lines, uh, as you can see in this image here, but we can tell it's a male. It's part of a genus that's kind of convoluted to, to dissect, to figure out what species we're looking at without it in hand. But this is a male of, the, of the, whatever species it is. Has those big lamellate antenna on the head there. And those are like the pages of a book or sort of like fingers. And it's a lot of surface area to pick up pheromones so he can go cruising around and, and find the ladies. Perfect. <laughs> so then the second one here, and we had two or three of these, found this guy floating in a soap solution, got him as well as the Japanese beetles. That makes sense. This is a grapevine beetle. They would also be there on the grapevines feeding. They do uh, very little damage in comparison to the Japanese beetle. And as a larva actually help decompose wood. So you can find them in hackberry and oak and things like that, and they'll nibble on that wood, and then they come out as this large gold scarab. Perfect, and number three is a few of these guys flying around, and this is in Grand Island. That's okay. a little bit more greenish. Yeah. They're very loud, and they dig the base of the grass into loose soil. So that is. I wonder if it's from spring grubs, too. Uh, yeah, so it is from a grub. This okay. is a green June beetle. That loud noise you're hearing is part of its mimicry of a bumblebee, supposedly. It sounds like a bumblebee and it might frighten you so you don't take a swat at it as it's flying around. And they are a semi-pest as a larva. They're a big grub, about an inch and a half to two inches long. They crawl on their back like this, army style, when they move on top of the soil as opposed to moving through the bottom of the soil and, or through the middle of it. And they can uproot the turf as they feed, when they feed on the thatch. They don't actually eat the grass roots like the other grubs do, but they do tunnel through it and cause some damage. We, we want to see that again. This, like this? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's really a powerful grub. <laughs> okay. All right, I wish we had a fourth one, then we could have had John, Paul, Ringo, and George. <laughs> <laughs> Next time. <laughs> okay, Dennis, you have a couple too. Okay. Uh, and um, this one is, she saw this yesterday, give or take, by the flower box. She's in Hickman on an acreage. Her husband told her to stick her hand in there, and I think she should have made him do it. So, And then this is the second one. And this is in North Bend, and I know they're not the same thing, but what do you think we got here? Yeah, well, the second one seems like it could be a vole just because of the tracking and the way it looks. Um, the first one, I'm leaning towards a cicada killer wasp because the way it's pushed the out and the way it's very <laughs> granular like that. So I'm going with Jonathan's insects for that <laughs> one. I'm going with six legs instead of the four legs on, on the, well, in the, uh, in the tie wall. And they're noted to always be in those kind of tie wall, so. Mm -hmm. And so you we, guys are doing a segment on cicada Yeah, cars. we should Pretty have quick. one coming out here soon, yeah. 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 Okay, good, so still don't stick your hand in the hole. And that's a vole <laughs> as well. Yeah, yeah, okay, all righty. So you only get one, Amy, I'm sorry. Man, I feel <laughs> deprived. But there are two pictures from two different people. Okay. Um, and this is a Washington Hawthorne. She uh, has included uh, several pictures of this bizarreness. Started as a little nodule and now it's covering some thorns. Her question, of course, was do you treat it with a pesticide? And I, and I think we know the answer. To we that. know the answer to this yeah. one. Um, I was actually impressed on the gall formation and this is the second picture. Mm -hmm. This is what we typically see. This is cedar hawthorn rust. Mm -hmm. And so what we see is the little horns coming off of the fruit of the hawthorn there. Those are the, it's producing the spores that go back to the cedar tree. On the first two pictures, what happened is the infection occurred on the stem and the plant is trying to overcome part of it um, and it's trying to seal it off. And so we're, we're just seeing some extra growth on it. Now, you can spray for cedar hawthorn rust. This isn't the time of year to do it. Mm -hmm. We're gonna be spraying it back when we have those nice little mummy heads on the cedar trees with all the gelatinous coming off of them. And that's usually around um, bud break. 
is when we're going to spray those hawthorns. Why do we have so much of it this year? It's because we had a very long, cool, wet spring. Uh, to me, it's probably one of the longest cool, wet springs I remember. And I know I'm not as old as some people uh, that are watching nice. the show. Nice. <laughs> yeah. But my or mom. sitting next to you. I know. My mom always gives me a hard time. But, you know, in my 30 plus years, it seemed like it was a really long spring. Mm -hmm. And so those spores were continually being produced by the cedars and going over to the hawthorns and causing that massive infection. Um, you're most likely going to see some premature leaf drop this fall. Um, but clean it up. It's not going to reinfect at this point in time. And, and if you really don't like it, you look the other way or pick a different tree. There you go. Thanks, Amy. Okay, Kelly, you only have one picture, too. This is the South Sioux City View. We're in a master gardener. Okay. Uh, they've had some hail up there. Um, peach tree that got planted this spring, and he wanted to espalier it on the fence. Serious damage on the top. He wonders whether he should take the top off or let it just be and see what happens and then do some pruning Okay, well, later. first, I commend him for not pruning now. Uh, that little small plant needed as much of that green tissue and green leaves and so on to photosynthesize and help it deal with that wounding. So good job there. And, you know, it's, it is a pretty nasty wound on such a small trunk already at this point. And the tree will never heal. Um, it will seal that, so it'll wall it off and then grow that callus growth around it. But, on, you know, I never know what to do with these. On such a small tree, I mean, it, it may do perfectly fine and it may be great for the rest of the, you know, the rest of its life. Uh, with peach trees, they're usually pretty short-lived, especially mm -hmm. in South Sioux City. Um, and it's a lot of work to put into a failure in, in, and then have it uh, in down the road have an issue. So. It's really up to the per individual. It's the plant is young enough. It looks like it's pretty vigorous. It may grow around it and do fine. Um, but it, if it's stressed down the road, um, it, it that could that wound could be the compartmentalization could break down and decay could go throughout the tree. All right, thank you, Kelly. Well, Outdoor Solutions and Heritage Nursery here in Lincoln have formed a really unique partnership with the help of some former university students. Their combined expertise with hardscapes and nursery material are the focus of our very first feature tonight. I started out actually at, at UNL working for landscape services. Um, I got my horticulture degree in landscape design, um, worked with Kim, uh, or studied under Kim for many years and uh, wound up here uh, working the sales department at uh, our company. Um, got my design degree from the university, decided that I like plants, but I also like the hardscape point of uh, things. I got into installing and designing uh, patios, retaining walls, uh, water features, things like that. With my degree from the university, basically it helps me on a day-to-day -day life with design. Um, when people ask me, what do I do with these rocks or what color would you use here or I have a water feature, I want to highlight some things on it. That design background allows me to come through and, and really complete everything for them and let them know um, the best options for them. Uh, well, at the university, um, I started with uh, architecture and then uh, switched to landscape architecture and really liked that. Uh, and then when I graduated, uh, I installed for a while and uh, loved the installation side of things, but realized I really liked working with customers a little more and uh, just learning more about plants and that brought me to Heritage Nursery. I mean, really, my university education helps with design. We get a lot of customers coming in, you know, with pictures on their cell phones saying, hey, what should I put here? Uh, and that just comes back to plant ID and plant design. Uh, we can really help them out and uh, walk around the nursery and kind of see what fits with them. My education at the University of Nebraska helps me do everything because it, uh, I learned from the plant ID courses what plants need shade, what, you know, the water tolerances of everything. So it just helps me do my job better. Ten years ago this company started and we decided to, we had all the uh, hardscape side of things put together as far as mulches and uh, rock and things like that goes, but we decided to bring our, our uh, heritage nursery in 
Uh, the companies just work together in the fact that they sell plants, we sell all the hardscape materials, and they go hand in hand together. I guess I, I've known Brandon Outdoor Solutions for eight years now, and uh, they just kind of approached us and said, hey, we want to do this, and it's going to be a great relationship. You know, we sell everything but plants. You guys only sell plants. And so it's kind of a, a landscape mall for someone who comes out looking for some anything for their home. I think it brings more people in just because they know that they only need to go to one place to get everything they need, whether it be hardscapes, you know, mulch, and then you can just stop over here and get the plants, kind of one-stop shop. Uh, the reason that the hardscape side of things and the plant side of things, the outdoor solutions, heritage nursery aspect goes together well, is because all these products all tie together um, when it comes to the whole aspect of the landscape. Um, you can come out here, pick up a few rocks, run over to Heritage, pick up a few plants, and get on your way and get your job started. You know, it's great to see former students making a difference in the world, and it also shows both the diversity and the breadth of our horticulture and landscape students and the possibilities in their future, and it make, makes a teacher's heart sing. <laughs> so there you go. <laughs> All right, picture two is yours, Jonathan, and this is McPherson County in the Sand Hills. Okay. Um, they cut down one tree, half inch large holes in the trunk, whole tree died, removed the tree. Now they're seeing the same thing. Um, mm. The pictures there are showing what we probably think it is, and, and he is wondering, will watering drive the invaders away from the other trees because they have had some dry spells? Okay. Um, wondering what they can do. So your trees look like they were stressed out for a while and that does attract things like the pine sawyer beetle, which is an insect that in scotch pines and other pines can move around a nematode that causes pine wilt, very destructive disease that's basically, it, it makes a tree toast. It's not gonna be something that you can really do if you see any symptoms in the tree already. So those trees that we see there in the foreground that look kind of infected already, it's probably best to get those taken down all the way past the stump and remove them and destroy that wood. Don't use it for anything, don't keep it around. That way you don't keep a population of the nematodes around. And try and keep those other trees healthy. You may wanna consider removing them as well, unless you wanna treat them in the future with something like abamectin, which would keep the nematode away, but it can be kind of costly and you have to do it every other year at least for it to work against the nematode. So it might be a, a cut bait kind of situation. Fish cut bait and yeah, cut something. That's right. <laughs> exactly. All right. Dennis, you have a couple of Lauren's favorite creature pictures. Oh, okay. Uh, the first one, oh. this was, uh, they were on a pontoon boat at Woodcliff. Snake was right on the shore. Yeah. Um, nobody could identify it. And first he was curled up and then he wasn't. Yeah. What do you think? It's Neurodia sipidon, northern water snake. It has a little more white than most. I would love to see it up close. I mean, in real, you know, real life to hold it. Um, <laughs> it looks like just a genetic aberration, but the, the scalation and the size and its habitat and knowing what's at Woodcliffe, it's definitely the northern or common water snake. Eats dead dying fish, is, you know, fine for you to pick them up, but they will bite, and then if they, you don't drop them, they'll vomit up all the dead fish on you. <laughs> and it's not just a little bit of vomiting, it's projectile vomiting to make you drop them. So just aim them towards your students. Well, that's what I do when I pick them up. Um, oh my gosh. So, but don't worry about them. They will approach your boat or dock, because <laughs> if you hook a fish, it lets out this chemical that to this animal is dinner call because they eat dead, dying fish. So if you are, they may come up towards your dock or boat. It's not, they're not after you, they're just after a meal. So enjoy That's them. Very interesting. Yeah. All right, thanks. And the second one we had earlier, but yeah. just the difference here. This is a bull snake. Yeah. This is a nice bull snake, good size, good coloration. Looks yeah. like it might've just went through exodysis or shedding. So it's, and bull snakes eat rodents. They love moles, they love gophers. They'll eat voles. So they're a rodent feeder teeth of a sixteenth of an inch. They, they open their mouth and try to make it like they're fierce, but they really aren't. Um, Can we have an impression of that? <laughs> <laughs> I have too many teeth. <laughs> and they're too big. And they're way too big, yeah. <laughs> um, and they feed on rodents, so perfect win-win situation with them. All right, thanks, Dennis. Okay, not nearly as exciting, <laughs> but really interesting, Amy. Uh, this is a Lincoln viewer. Uh, they have fescue. 
-hmm. And they've seen this really random and patchy, and that is a fabulous picture. Um, it's, it turns a little dark purplish at night. at night. It's that color during the day. She actually sprayed it with malathion because she thought it was insect eggs, and now she's cutting it out with her scissors. Oh, you're going to a lot of work. Um, <laughs> for me, that's a picture I would blow up and put on my wall. Uh, it's slime molds mm -hmm. is what it is, and they come in a wide variety of beautiful colors, uh, very vibrant. You got the yellows, the oranges, and then this blue-purple color. Um, the slime molds only grow on the surface of the fescue leaves or any of the grass species. It isn't hurting the grass at all. Um, is just using it as a home for a, the time being. Um, if you really don't like it, you, you can go clip it, but that's a lot of work. Just take the hose and do a strong spray of water and you'll just be able to wash it right off because it's not attached to the leaf. It's just kind of sitting there, kind of like a lichen. It's just sitting there just calling it home for right now. But um, you don't need to change anything in your management practices um, and you can just enjoy it or just spray it away. And I can see why she thought it might be an insect. Oh, it's yeah. It's a little buggy, mm -hmm. yeah. Little buggy things. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. All right, Kelly. Um, this is a picture, uh, ID picture. This is an okay. Omaha viewer. Uh, we see we have this in Lincoln, mm -hmm. too. Um, it's growing on the north side of their house in a bed of hostas. Uh, they want to know what it is and mm -hmm. what should they do about it. Okay, well, it's another interesting plant. This is an arum. Uh, could be Italian arum. Um, and this is a plant that you, what you're looking at is, well, that's a spathe, but that's uh, the fruiting structure, and these will turn red. And the foliage looks like it's declining, and this is natural. The, the foliage will die back in the summer, and then it'll regrow this autumn. Um, but just enjoy them as they're growing. It's a good shade plant. It's related to our uh, native Jack in the Pulpit. Um, they're not in the same genus, but it is related to them. So those should turn orangish, orangish red. So enjoy them and I would keep the plant. And don't eat them because the yes. yeah, calcium yes. oxalate crystals will right. slice they your mouth. They are poisonous. Thanks, Kim. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you want your mouth sliced open. Okay, then Negative. have at it. <laughs> well, Nebraska Extension educator Terry James has been focusing on individual All-American selections in our garden. Let's take a minute to see what she's looking at this week out in the backyard farmer garden. This week in the backyard farmer garden we're going to continue to look at the 2017 All-America selection winners that we have and how they're doing in our garden. This week we're going to look at a new fennel. It's called Antares. Um, it's looking pretty good in our garden. We did start them in the greenhouse. However, you can direct seed these. One of the things is about this is that they are small, so you can put them in a container. They're very attractive, so they kind of have those light, airy ferns that will go great in, for texture in containers or in your garden. Um, you're gonna have that licorice taste in the bulb, which is edible. However, you can also um, use this as a pollinator, which is what we are doing. We're actually not gonna pick these out of our garden because we saw the swallowtails putting their eggs on these. So we're gonna sit and let and have swallowtail caterpillars eat these up for their dinner this week. So that's what's happening in the backyard farmer garden this week. You know, so it's really great to let some of that produce, the fennel and the dill, stay in your garden, help those butterflies get off to the right start. And of course, I love dill, so I don't think you can have too much. The master gardeners disagree. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty much everywhere if they don't keep track of it. Mm -hmm. All right, we have a couple questions, and they actually did send pictures, okay. but I think you can do this without pics. And it's about... You have a lot of faith in me. I do. <laughs> and, and they are a, a, a gray insect. Okay. And Amy, you said you have a lot of them mm -hmm. too. And one of them does think they're bl blister beetles eating okay. everything, and I, they're both blister beetles. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk about blister beetles and what to do about them, Sure, Jonathan. we deal with several different kinds of blister beetles in Nebraska. There's the gray, the lined blister beetle. Uh, there's several different varieties out there, but they all are beneficial when they're larvae. They eat grasshopper eggs. They burrow down in the soil and they find the grasshopper egg pods and they just chew them all up and help us to destroy those pests. So if you see grasshoppers in a year, if you see a lot of grasshoppers in a year, it could be an indicator that you might see a lot of blister beetles the next year or the same year. And they are kind of hazardous as an adult. The name isn't for fun. It is a <laughs> blister-causing beetle. If you pick it up, a chemical will exude from their skin that makes them 
it makes your hand kind of blister up and it's very painful. Uh, so don't handle them with your bare hands. If you're gonna squish them, wear gloves, not leather gloves that can absorb the chemical, but maybe something a little more repellent like a latex glove or a rubber glove. And if you're having problems with them on potatoes and things like that, Seven is labeled for use against blister beetles on a lot of our garden crops. So just be careful with it when you use it that you don't harm our pollinating insects. Exactly, and, and that window of time is is now, I guess. When you're seeing the blister beetles active, that would be the time to spray. You don't want a preventative spray. You want to do a curative control right Excellent. now when they're out and about. All right, thank you, Jonathan. All right, you mentioned moles and snake, or yeah, a yeah. snake. Well, in O'Neill, Amy, mm -hmm. apparently we have lots of mole questions right now. And if they really don't have snakes and don't want them, what do they do? <laughs> well, there's a lot of ways you can take care of moles. You can use mechanical things, such, like some of the mole traps. There's harpoon mole traps and choker mole traps. Um, we have an excellent guide uh, at wildlife.unl.edu. And you can also use a toxicin. Um, it looks like a gummy worm, and there's several different brands. Follow the directions exactly and use latex or nitrile gloves when handling the gummy worms and do not cut them because the poison's only in one little spot. Uh, things like repellents and poison peanuts will not work. Hmm. So either the gummy worm as a toxicant or the mechanical traps and you'll get rid of your moles. Okay, and not the ultrasound. No, ultra no, that doesn't sees. work. Yeah. yeah. You'll just go around going, oh, I hope I don't have any more holes in my yard. You won't get rid of me. Okay. All right, Amy, uh, we've had a lot of these kinds of questions. Uh, again, a picture, but you won't need it. Uh -huh. Big old brown patches of turf. Oh, it's a beautiful time of year for brown patch. <laughs> going one everywhere. So if you get on your hands and knees and take a really close look at it, if it's a wider blade like the fescues, it's easier to see. You're going to see a tan lesion. Um, irregular in shape with a really dark border around it. Um, the yards that we actually see more brown patch in <coughs> are the ones that are over fertilized. Mm -hmm. uh, the ones that are more lush is where we're gonna see brown patch. So what are we gonna do? Uh, we can overseed this fall with a resistant variety, which I highly suggest, and then that variety will slowly take over in your yard. The other thing I would always suggest is you need to make sure you look at your fertilizer program for your lawn making sure that you're putting on the majority of your nitrogen in the fall and not putting it all on the spring. If we see people putting too much on the spring and having that really thick and luscious, fast growing turf, we're gonna see more brown patch. So maybe look at your nitrogen applications also. And if it's really bothersome, you can always do a fungicide application. Um, but for most home lawns, I don't recommend a fungicide application. All right, thank you, Amy. <clears throat> Excuse me. Mm -hmm. Kelly, this is an Omaha viewer that has kohlrabi. Okay. Uh, experienced gardener with mm -hmm. it. Um, she's rotated the crop, but she's not getting any, any of them to actually bulb up and form mm. the kohlrabis. Hmm. Any idea? Um, no, I'm not, I've never heard of a specific reason why they do that. You know, I'm, I'm, if she's experienced, I'm sure she's thinned them out um, so that they're not overcrowded. Um, I judged a fair yesterday and it was some of the most largest beautiful kohlrabi, so sorry that yours aren't doing that. Um, I, yeah, I don't know. I don't know a reason. Maybe, uh, maybe email. We can check it out a little bit further and see if there's some specific reasons why right. the kohlrabi won't. Perfect. Other than being too overcrowded. Right. Good. Good. Excellent. Thank you, Kelly. <laughs> All right. You ready, Kelly? I'm ready. Uh, we have a viewer who says her bleeding hearts turn yellow and then they disappear midsummer, and she wonders if she can stop this. Yeah, no, this is normal. They will keep doing it every year. That it's perfectly normal. Okay. We have a viewer who has smelly water in a rain barrel and she wonders whether she can use it for her potted plants. It, it should be fine to use for your potted plants. Maybe do not use it for uh, edible plants, vegetables. Um, and you might wanna look at cleaning out that rain barrel um, it, and maybe having a screen over the, if it's a gutter to keep debris out of there. Those are some of the things that uh, may lead to smelliness. All right, we have viewers that have plants that are wilting in the heat even though the soil is wet, should they water anyway? No, if the soil's wet, it might be wet wilt and you're overwatering. so cut back on watering. All right, Ken, uh, this viewer wants to know if they can start peaches from year-old dry peach pits. Well, you can start them from peaches, but if they're a year old, they may not no longer be viable. So you can try it though, you're not out anything, um, but it would be better to collect fresh ones. And usually, I'm not sure, they may need to go over the winter in cold storage um, and then plant them next uh, late winter, early spring. All right, 
good, good set of questions, nice answers. Mm -hmm. You ready? Yes. Okay. We have a viewer who's, who actually sent us a picture of apples showing brown scabby spots on them. What to do now? Oh, beautiful scab. Nothing we can do now. You needed a spray earlier in the season. And speaking of scabs, we have someone who is digging their potatoes, but the skins are covered with scabs. Scabs. That's a theme. <laughs> uh, potato scab is really a tough one to manage. Uh, there are some varieties of potatoes that are more resistant or tolerant to it. You can do that. Um, it's a soil-borne pathogen. There isn't a lot. You can try to overwater, but then you have to be careful because then you end up with other rot issues. So look at a different variety. You can still eat the potatoes, though. All right. Um, we have a viewer who has romas, roma tomatoes that have rotten ends. He thinks it's B-E-R, bl blossom, blossom end rot. What to do? Blossom end rot. It's associated with sometimes low calcium. Adding calcium right now is not going to make a difference, but we also see it with irregular watering also. So hot, dry, we throw on a couple, two inches of water, hot, dry, and we'll see a little bit more. All right, nice job. Okay, Dennis, Okay. you ready? Yep. Uh, this is a Grand Island viewer. They want to know, is there any way to keep the squirrels from getting their fruit short of netting the entire whole tree? Very, very difficult. You either trap the squirrels and, and move them out, or you're going to have to net the tree. Okay. Uh, an Ogallala viewer says they saw something that looked like a badger. Are they out in the Big Mac area? Oh, yeah. I was out at our Cedar Point and saw plenty of badgers. They eat prairie dogs. <laughs> okay. How do you keep turkey vultures away? This is a Lincoln viewer. Uh, that's a tough one. Um, they're somewhat protected, and they're beneficial. If they're causing a lot of droppings, it's a matter of trimming those trees. Okay. When water temperatures get this high, what does that do to fish and turtles in the ponds? Well, usually they go deep. If it's a shallow pond, like a backyard pond, you need to cool it down at the deep end. And what's that temperature? I would say keep it below 80 All right. Fahrenheit. Okay, there's a two inch hole in a vertical cliff or two foot hole at Midway Lake. What could do that? It's going to be something that's preying upon the, cli the cliff's um, swallows. Probably a large predatory bird, okay. like an owl or hawk that right. can dig this, into the side. This is a Fort Calhoun viewer that said it sounds like they have birds in their chimney. Well, they could have birds in their chimney or could have bats in their chimney. <laughs> or in there. <laughs> Belfry. Belfry. <laughs> I didn't you say that. <laughs> I didn't say you that. missed your cue. Mm -hmm. All right, nice job. You ready, Jonathan? That's a tough. That's a tall glass of water right there. Seven, <laughs> seven answers. Okay, we have an Omaha viewer who says, "When will the squash vine borers appear so he can protect his plants from the egg layers?" Now they're out and about right now, flying and laying their eggs. All right. Uh, does BT work in the heat and on squash vine borer eggs? Squash vine borer eggs would not be controlled by BT. BT could conceivably control the larvae that come out, but it might be better to use bifenthrin or carbaryl at the very base of the plant where the eggs are or scrape the eggs off. Okay. Are mosquito dunks safe for pools and pets, or is there something else that is less expensive that works? Mosquito dunks are great. That is a BT product, only affects the mosquito larvae. If you want, you could try chlorine tabs in a little pool but both work, both are kind of cheap. All right, uh, Japanese beetles, do we treat the adults now and how? You can use neem on plants that you want to protect right now. If it's a short plant, if it's a tall plant, you just need to kind of wait out the damage, unfortunately, at this point. All right, does milky spore work for Japanese beetles? No, university research does not support it. All right, is it too late for merit to control uh, to treat grubs. We would have preferred to see that out before July 4th, but you can try it now if you really want to, but it probably won't offer you a whole lot of protection. Awesome. Excellent job. <laughs> All right, Kelly, plant of week. Plant of the week. And uh, Beautiful white plants here. Yeah, kind of okay. whitish, and it kind of had a little squirrely sort of an appearance tonight. But <laughs> <laughs> well, this white one is David's Phlox, and this is a beautiful, you know, bloomer in the heat. It's known for being a mildew-resistant phlox because many of our phloxes will get mildew, and it does best in full sun, and this is quite tall. It can get three feet at least, and often will get up to 48, not 48 inches as well. So that's uh, David Phlox. Always oh, that bright, vivid white. Too bad it needs full sun because it would provide a lot of uh, light in a shady area. 
I'm going to turn around. This is one of the alliums. There's many alliums that we grow there. That's in the onion family. And there's many that we grow as perennials uh, for ornamental. And some of them are lar very tall and they have large balls, but this is a smaller one. This is called Millennium Allium. And as I said, they're in the onion family. It's a sterile variety, so it won't develop any seed or little bulbules. Um, and it's another one that blooms late, mid to late summer and uh, uh, it's just full sun, ideal for full sun. Excellent and beautiful foliage, and mm -hmm. the pollinators love that one. Yeah, and nothing else eats it because it's, because an, it's an onion. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you, Kelly. All right, Jonathan, uh, you actually have just one picture. Great. This okay. Time. <laughs> <laughs> I actually have one viewer, two okay. pictures. Uh, her question is Does she have bugs in her wind chimes? She sure does. This is caused <laughs> by a grass carrying wasp. So the wasp female, she goes out and she carries dry blades of grass back to a tube or a window runner or a hole in a stem, places like that. And she stuffs her eggs in there with the grass and she puts tree crickets in there that she stings and the tree crickets are still alive and her babies eat them and that's how they gain their nutrition. And they'll hatch out here in the next couple of weeks and start flying around and start the whole cycle over again. Really interesting. Nature's wondrous pageantry, I mean, right? Yeah. I mean, I that was charming. <laughs> 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 or music, or chiming. <laughs> okay, Dennis. On that note, back to the just oh to, the owl, yes. Well, the no, the shell. belfry thing. Oh, um, here's a way to tell if they're hearing the flapping at dawn, it's probably birds. If they're hearing the flapping at dusk, it's probably bats. Interesting. So. When you're hearing that flapping, most prominent in the chimney, it'll tell you which species it is. Okay, and and by the way, if our viewers were watching, there was a little baby owl for our beauty shot, and we think that was what? I think it was a screech owl. It was hard to see. It was a juvenile, and uh, I'm not the best at birds. You know, they're just reptiles gone bad in the whole evolutionary <laughs> scheme. Um, but it is a beautiful owl. I do it's like owls. Yeah, in Midtown Omaha, in our yeah. bird bath. Yeah. Isn't that fun? Yeah. Okay, so now your real picture. This is. Uh, okay. Found this guy uh, on the screen door in Platte County. He's about two and a half inches long. Cool. Wonders what he is. It's a uh, Hylocososceles. This is the Cope's gray tree frog. And this is one of our amphibians that's extending its range. It used to only be in the eastern third of Nebraska, but we're now finding them as far west as North Platte, Calamus, and almost to Valentine along the Niobrara. Hmm. So it's, it's now that we're letting trees grow along our rivers and streams, the tree frog is extending its range. They don't hurt anything, carry no germs or viruses, eat a lot of bugs. Awesome. All right, uh, <clears throat> Amy, we've had a couple of these already this season. This mm -hmm. is a Holdridge viewer. She's wondering what happened to her buttercup squash. Uh, one day they were taking over the alley and the next day they gave up. <laughs> okay. I'll talk about the pathology. Um, there's a wonderful disease called um, bacterial wilt that's transmitted by the cucumber beetle. And a cucumber beetle feeds on it, transmits the bacteria, and then that bacteria actually plugs up the vascular tissue that's moving the water and the nutrients in the plant. And you're gonna see this sudden wilting. Uh, once you start seeing that there isn't a lot you can do for the plant, it, except remove it from the situation. And if you really wanna know if it's bacterial wilt, one of the easiest ways is to cut the stem that's wilted and take a small little glass of water and stick the stem in it. If it's bacterial wilt, that water's gonna get a milky color to it. That's all the bacteria coming out, so it's a quick, easy one. Um, on the entomology side, it could be squash vine borer moving in at this yeah. point in time. It's gonna give you the exact same type of symptoms, that wilting, because it's not able to get the water movement. So. Um, you can look for the eggs, and if it's squash vine borer, uh, Fred always said you could take a toothpick and s <laughs> s try to squish them in there, but it's <laughs> it's a losing battle in my opinion. <laughs> exactly. All right. Thanks, Amy. Uh, Kelly, this is a, a viewer who has volunteer plants growing along their fence. Okay. Smell like garlic, <laughs> look like garlic, a little bit of a reddish tint. They mm -hmm. wonder if they're garlic and can he eat them. Well. Um, if they smell like and look like, um, I think they probably are. Uh, there is a red gar a garlic that it has a purple, it's purple garlic, but it kind of has red stripes. They peeled quite a bit of the uh, 
outer skin off, so it's hard to tell the exact color, but if you look close, you can kind of see some purple striping. There's different heirloom garlic out there, too. There's also, um, you know, that other, the first, first photo, it looked like little bulbs up on top. Those are like a tree onion, sometimes they're called, but uh, garlic will be top forming and form little bulbs up on top. So I'm not 100% sure, but I'm gonna, since it smells like garlic, looks like garlic, I'm gonna lean towards garlic and rather than a multiplier. And onion. it wouldn't poison any. Poison no, anyway. no. Walks like a duck, talks like a duck. <laughs> there's poison also, onion. there's walking poison. onions, Egyptian walking onions, but I don't quite think it's Egyptian walking onion. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, a great choice for color and versatility in your garden might be some daylilies. And about 20 years ago, Harmony Nursery near Benedict, Nebraska began growing a wide variety of these gorgeous flowers. Here to tell us more is Harmony Nursery owner, Jenny Harrington. So the great thing about daylilies, they are well suited for Nebraska. They can take our heat, they can take the interesting springs we have, whether it's dry or wet. Um, they can grow in a variety of areas. Um, they're going to want to mainly be in sun, um, but as I tell my customers in Nebraska, if we get four hours of sun a day between 10 and 2, um, that's enough for a daylily to be pretty happy. Um, there are some cultivars that can grow in shade and it's just a matter of finding the right place for the right plant. Um, and some of them like a little shade in the afternoon. Our sun in, in the summertime in Nebraska gets very intense. So some of the darker colors, the reds, the purples, um, may enjoy a little shade in the afternoon. So if it's in an area where a tree shades it by two o'clock in the afternoon, that's almost a perfect setting for a daylily. Sometimes um, just with the, the weather, um, there can be some environmental issues with the daylilies as summer comes on and they can be cut back and they will refoliate themselves. It may interrupt the bloom somewhat because they're getting their energy from those leaves. But if the plant foliage doesn't look nice, it's just perfectly fine to, to cut it back. We'll cut them back, oh, maybe two, maybe about four, six to four inches, that would, would be okay. So daylilies can be divided um, throughout the growing season from April through September. Um, the easiest time to divide them is when they're first coming up in April, when the ground is open to go ahead and dig, then you're not disturbing the foliage. Um, it's just going to be, you know, little bits of foliage. Um, probably the easiest time to divide is then. Um, during the summertime, you know, you're going to interrupt the blooming, so we kind of try and stay away from that. And then we dig in the fall um, for our customers for whatever they've purchased. And um, that's a great time to get those bare roots in the ground growing. The soil's still warm, the temperature above grounds moderates a little bit, so it's easier for those to take hold in the fall. So daylilies can be purchased um, at a retail center, and I would recommend going to a reputable nursery that would have nursery stock coming in that is fit for our area. Um, the other thing that's fun with daylilies is to tour um, daylily gardens, um, people that are growing them on farms. Um, that is what I've done. So you actually see the plant growing in the ground. If it's doing well in Nebraska gardens, it'll do well in your garden. Some of the favorite daylilies at Harmony Nursery um, are Royal Delight. It is an intense purple with a ruffled edge. It does great in the heat of the afternoon. They call that Sun Fast, so it keeps its color. And then another really cool one is called Love Fest. It is probably 36 inches tall with a seven inch bloom, cherry red with an orange throat. The other one that we love is Outrageous. And true to the name, it has a burnt orange color with a maroon eye and it is flat and recurved, which is a form of the bloom, and it is just stunning as well. You know, there's such a wide variety of daylily color sizes and textures, and they really are pretty easy to grow. Pollinators don't like them, but Dennis says the snakes do. Yep. So. <laughs> Our snakes love a lot of big wads of daylilies because it, it supports them for sunning, and they can get right underneath there and hide, eat insects and worms, and 
stay away from the birds and cats. <laughs> All right, so it is now um, caterpillar mania. Okay. Four of them, uh, and it's pretty much what is this caterpillar? Okay. There's this this cool looking little horny top thing. <laughs> <laughs> Horn that's, top. <laughs> that's an American dagger moth caterpillar, and it will turn into a moth that's got about a two inch wingspan, kind of grayish brown, has little markings all over its wings, and the larvae have those black spikes that you see there. You just be careful if you do touch it. Hairy caterpillars like this sometimes can cause rashes on certain people. Perfect, and the second one is uh, Central Omaha. That is a baby version of the previous caterpillar, yeah. so just his little brother. Yeah, and apparently uh, it, she hit it with a stick and it hissed at her. Sure, okay. <laughs> 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 or actually, this is the hisser. Oh, this okay. Is, yeah, this is the one. Okay, yeah, this so. is a walnut sphinx moth caterpillar. And it's a really cool caterpillar. It's got the horn tail there at the tip. They have a weird head. It looks like they're always wearing a hoodie, sort of. It's kind of pointed there towards the opposite end of the horn. And they have these white pokey things all over their body. They don't hurt us or anything, but it's a big, beautiful hawk moth as an adult. Perfect. And then number four is, um, just barely see them in there on our borage. That's a painted lady caterpillar inside of there. They spin a little protective nook that they kind of hide out in and they feed in. Okay. And it turns into a beautiful orange and brown and white butterfly as an adult. So we pretty much have, these are all way cool little creepy crawly caterpillars yeah. that turn into really cool. Caterpillars are always awesome. <laughs> <laughs> all right, thank you, Jonathan. All right, Dennis. Yes. Um, you get a snail picture. Snail. Because they okay. are not insects. Okay, but they're not <laughs> vertebrate either. <laughs> Uh, I know. So they're, they're, escar they're escargot. And that's actually what he said. He does like escargot. This is in Lincoln. Actually, that'd be great food for a decays brown snake. Because decays brown snakes that we have in the eastern part of the state, they have a small head and they, and they eat slugs and they love to put their heads in land snails and they suck them out. So they'd be food, good food for a good snake. What do they want to know about? Well, he said he found hundreds of those on the concrete and the, and the blocks and he wonders if they... He installed new mulch, and, and he's hoping they did not come from some exotic place and hitchhike in. I doubt it. With all the moisture we've been having, it's been an area that we had some good moisture in a long spring, as Amy was saying. I think our snail population is pretty high. Yeah. And they just break down, you know, they're detritus feeders, so they, they pretty much break down stuff. They will, you know, sometimes get in the hostas and things like that, but they're just breaking it down. Okay, cool. All right, Amy, uh, a couple of oak pictures. Mm -hmm. The first one is a red oak that looks terrible. This is in North Platte. Um, about 10 years old, leaves are curling and browning, and they've been doing this for about three plus years. Um, they think oak wilt. I would lean against oak wilt. We haven't been able to find it in the North Platte area. We've only found oak wilt in the Omaha area. Um, if you go back to that picture, one thing I would be concerned about is the location of that tree. Mm -hmm. If it isn't a little bit of sun scald, um, the heat coming off of the driveway uh, right there, and it's pretty close in those roots trying to go out and not finding enough water. Uh, especially in that North Platte area, we've been extremely dry. Supplemental watering those trees, besides what's done, the lawn sprinkler is really critical. And you can tell if it's scorched because it's going to brown on the tip of the leaf and work its way in. Um, and then we saw a little bit of scorch on the second photo also. Um, the second photo was actually interesting. You saw a section where the leaves are kind of curled. That's actually herbicide injury. And then the tip, the tip was fine. It's just where it was at growing at that point in time and what got exposed to the herbicide. But that was also looking like some sun scald issues too. Add a little bit of water to those trees and you should be okay. All righty, thank you, Amy. All right, uh, Kelly, a couple IDs that are totally unrelated, but they're IDs. Um, the first one is actually south of Craig. Okay. I want to know what this vining weed is and the proper disposal method. Okay, well, this is wood vine. Um, some people call it Virginia creeper too. However, they are technically they're two separate plants, two different species, but related. But this one's wood vine. Uh, the main difference is these don't have aerial roots, so they kind of creep or crawl along the ground. Um, although they can climb a tree. And control, um, hand pulling, the glove of death with glyphosate, or maybe that new product of glyphosate, uh, to let, that's like a deodorant, mm -hmm. a gel. 
Um, this one, the second one with yellow flowers is tansy, mm -hmm. and it has those nice button flowers. Uh, that foliage you see there is not the foliage. It has more of a ferny foliage to it. I think it's hid behind that larger foliage. Mm -hmm. um, it was brought here from Europe. Uh, there is some, it's considered some toxicity to it. And in, in some states and some areas, it's considered an invasive species, but uh, not in Nebraska yet. All right, thank you, Kelly. Well, announcements of cool things in the gardening world, beginning, Dennis, with snakes. Yes. <laughs> snakes of Nebraska live at Mahoney State Park, yes. the 22nd, 23rd, and we're assuming you will be there. Yeah, I'll be there, and I'll bring at least 25 of the 29 species with me of the state that I've caught across the state. And you get to see them all. Perfect. And you get to see me. <laughs> That's better yet. <laughs> then we also have, it's iris time, Omaha Iris Society rhizome sale, the 28th. Number on the screen for that one. Lincoln is doing the same thing. Theirs is Saturday the 29th. We have a number on the screen for that one. And then, of course, our wonderful produce from the heart. Uh, every Tuesday through September, you can donate at the Backyard Farmer Garden. And our numbers are rising. The Grow Row donations this week were almost 100 pounds. Backyard Farmer Garden, uh, 245 pounds total. So great thing to That's be awesome. able to send that yeah. uh, to people yeah. who would, who would be able to use it. All right, um, we have questions from viewers. Let's see, let's start uh, with a Denton viewer here, Jonathan. Has insects like lightning bugs near the beets? They, uh, they look like them, but they aren't. Oh. And they appear to be coming out of the ground. Okay, it, it could be lightning bugs that don't have uh, bioluminescence, but more likely soldier beetles that could be there. Typically not a big issue, so I wouldn't treat for soldier beetles. All right, Dennis. This is a Lexington viewer. Um, little toads, 10,000 in the lawns. Um, how are they getting there? And so where did they come from? It's been dry this year out there. Yeah, but there's, toads leave the water and they can go like a half mile from any water, but they don't need much water. A puddle or a ditch that filled up for just four weeks will allow them to lay their eggs, metamorphose, and become tiny, tiny little toads. And when they lay eggs, they lay 10,000 eggs. And only one's gonna make it to adulthood. The other, you know, 999,000 <laughs> are gonna get eaten by birds and, every, and lizards and everything else. Just enjoy them, they can't hurt anything. Just don't lick them. Oh. <laughs> You're on a roll tonight. Yeah. All right, Amy, if you can stop laughing. Uh, this is a, a viewer who uh, had great looking beans and then pulled some out and then they keep collapsing. Um, she's seeing mold at the bottoms of the plants. They're mulched with newspaper and straw. She did say the healthy plants are producing beans and she's worried that they're, are they okay to eat? Oh, the beans are perfectly fine to eat. If you're seeing that cottony mycelia growth, you're most likely dealing with white mold. Mm. Um, it is a common fungal disease. We. We see it in green beans, dry beans, and in soybeans. It's not specific on the bean, and it can infect the beans themselves. So if the bean is hanging down far enough, we can get that mycelium growth, and it's gonna get soft and nasty. Uh, those beans you wanna wanna eat. Management, there really isn't anything you can do. Um, next year, definitely rotate. Uh, don't plant beans in the same spot, and sometimes, looking at controlling your population in there, not so many beans so you can get a little bit more airflow in there will help reduce the sclerotinia. All right, Kelly, we have about 20 seconds. Yeah, okay. A Bellevue viewer wants to know whether the fireworks on July 4th would have deposited any harmful residue on his garden produce? Uh, none that I'm aware of, but if you're always worried about that, water after the event, which it's a little late now, but that's one way to deal with it. And certainly wash that produce Be, regardless. Eat it, just, always wash it. Yeah, yeah, interesting. People kind of forget that perhaps one of Dennis's critters has been out there. You know. <laughs> why mine? <laughs> and, and why are they mine? <laughs> because you take all of them. <laughs>